So are cars harder to maintain nowadays? A lot of people say that they've got built-in obsolescence, so they're specifically designed to fail at a set period of time. And many people complain about the many different electronic devices and gadgets that cars come with. And inherently, when you make something more complex, it's got more opportunity to fail. Let's just look at the question, are cars harder to maintain now than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago? Have things got worse or have things improved? Are we looking at the past through those those rose tinted spectacles? Do we long for those days when you can go out effectively with your pen knife and fix whatever problem it was that you had on your car? So it's fair to say that early engines were crude compared to their modern counterparts. Fuel was measured out through a carburetor system. So you only had roughly the right amount of fuel for any given engine load or condition within the engine. We even had manual chokes. So when the engine was warming up, we had to manually pull out the choke in order to dump a little bit more fuel in to keep the car running and idling smoothly and allow it to warm up more quickly. The manufacturing process processes and tolerances were also much worse. We've got to remember that all through history, things have been done to a budget. The manufacturers have always wanted to push out cars at the lowest price point they can to make the maximum amount of profit. So in those bygone days, we didn't have such extensive emissions regulations for manufacturers to meet, so they could cut corners on production values. So a lot of the intakes, a lot of the manifolds, a lot of the casting that was used left very rough surfaces, which wasn't great for fuel economy or airflow. But this was a time where fuel didn't cost that much. So so it didn't really matter. No one particularly cared. And it gave the aftermarket tuner a wonderful blank canvas to work on. So substantial improvements can be made with minimal knowledge to those early engines. But the downside of this simplicity was just the unreliability. Cars would often stall. They would often fail to start. Do you remember, are you old enough like me to remember the adverts for cars where it always stated starts first time every time? Or it's a reliable daily runner. Nowadays, they're things that we assume. You don't have to state it on an advert. To keep an old car running efficiently and effectively, it often required continual recalibration of the carburetor just to make sure that the fueling and the metering was exactly right going into the engine. So what about that claim that modern cars are designed to fail at a certain point in time? Well, that may certainly seem to be the case. A lot of cars have ridiculously silly problems that crop up. And that might lead you to conclude that the manufacturers are just trying to make more money. But actually, the manufacturers are only really concerned in producing a car that lasts the length of the warranty. So if they've given you a two, three, five or 10 year warranty, they've got to make sure that they're not going to run up lots of bills. So it's in their interest to make sure the car is reliable through that warranty period. And that's really their aim. That's the target that they want to reach. The sad fact is that often cheap electronics, cheap components are used and it's often these little plastic bits that fail. I've just had a window go on my Audi A3 and it was a tiny little plastic clip that broke that just prevented the window from sliding up and down. I've also heard conspiracy theories that it's all a great big plan to rid the world of the internal combustion engine. So we're going to get to a point where the manufacturers are only selling electric cars and we can't buy the parts to maintain our internal combustion engines. There's certainly many campaigns underway for classic cars cars because people want to keep those on the road. They're part of our motoring heritage. So particularly in the UK, there is a vast group of enthusiasts dedicated to preserving these classic cars for future generations. So are cars harder to maintain? What's changed? Well, your modern car is filled with very, very sophisticated computer systems and a lot of different electronics, pipes and valves to just make sure everything runs efficiently. So these often improve reliability of the car. They improve the safety and they certainly improve the fuel economy. Manufacturers have been forced to meet ever more stringent emissions regulations and emission standards. So are things better? Let's just think about the past for a moment. How do you feel about asbestos in your brake pad? What about leaded fuel? What about cross-ply tyres? 
they're nowhere near as good as the modern radial tyres. They certainly made the car much more unpredictable and difficult to drive in various conditions. Lighting has improved. We have LEDs, HID high intensity discharge lights, and they produce a much sharper, cleaner, brighter light than the old halogen bulbs that we use that we always seem to be replacing. When was the last time you had to replace a bulb on your car? These LED and HID bulbs do seem to last a lot longer than those early halogen bulbs. The windscreens or windshields are now made with laminated glass. We have seat belts, we have ABS systems, we've got adaptive cruise control, we've got impact collision systems, crash protection systems built into cars. So cars are much safer, they're much easier to drive and they're more reliable. So we shouldn't really look too much to the past with those rose tinted spectacles because things weren't all rosy back then. There were a lot of problems that we've only recently become aware of. So we're moving towards a safer, more efficient, cleaner transport. So in the past, you could just have a basic set of tools, literally your pocket knife with all its different options and settings was often enough to make most of the adjustments that you needed to a car. But now you need a lot of specialized tools and you often need to delve into the electronics of the car. You also need some kind of gadget to plug into the car's OBD onboard diagnostic port so that you can download those codes and make diagnosis of faults and problems that you're experiencing. A personal annoyance of mine is that often different brands use very weird socket sizes. Now, French cars in particular, every time I've tried to work on a French car, the socket sizes that I've got have either been slightly too big or slightly too small. I never seem to have the exact size socket to fit whatever bolts they fitted. We've also got Torx screw heads, which are extensively used in the interior components of the car, the electronics. So a lot of people do not even have a Torx screwdriver set at home. It makes repairs exclusive to people that have got the correct set of Torx screws and screwdrivers. The benefit though of the Torx screws is that they are less likely to wear. The amount of times I have shredded a Phillips or cross-headed screw and just been unable to remove it without having to practically drill it out or use a specialized tool to remove it. But those Torx bolts seem pretty reliable in terms of being able to undo them and do them up again. So although it's an annoyance, it is certainly progress. They do seem to be more reliable and last. The computers in cars are much more complex now and often you need to make adaptations within the software for things that have been changed on the car. Your modern battery on a stop start car is a classic example. It needs to be recoded. The car's computer needs to know the specs of the battery so that it can make good decisions in terms of whether to disable the stop start or not and determine how much residual charge there is. And also the computer is controlling so many different parts of the car. If you make substantial changes, the manufacturers have built in a bit of leeway, so a certain amount of trim goes on to the fuel and the air mix and the ignition timing if it's a gasoline or petrol powered car. But when you start pushing things to the limit, you need to make bigger adaptations in the software. So that requires a whole different skill set from the chap that was just twiddling the jets on his carburetor. So we've now got turbochargers, twin scroll turbochargers, dual turbochargers, we've got direct fuel injection and various hybrid engine systems that incorporate battery power with the internal combustion engine. So things are certainly getting more complex. There's more components being added to a car requiring more knowledge and different manufacturers are doing very different things. So you really do require specific knowledge of the manufacturer's car that you're working on. In meeting those emissions regulations, manufacturers have had to add so many different sensors to cars just to monitor everything and make sure that all of these different systems are working properly. So we now have DPS or particulate filters, even on gasoline or petrol engines now, very complex fuel systems that are operating at extremely high pressures. Those direct injection fuel systems push out much more pressure than the early fuel injection systems that would go into the port. The addition of catalysts as well require a very efficient burn. If you start dumping unburnt fuel into a catalyst, it can cause the catalyst to overheat and that's a very expensive repair. So manufacturers are really forced by emissions regulations to meet those emission standards and add all of this complexity to an engine, which makes the engine more efficient. There's probably less we can do to a modern engine than we could to a 
a more basic historical engine. But the manufacturers, in fairness, have gone a long way to give us the performance that we crave already. It's fair to say as well that engines are more powerful than they used to be. I just remember growing up in the 80s, the Ford Sierra Cosworth, the RS Cosworth, was the monster car that everyone wanted. And it put out a massive 224 horsepower. Nowadays, we see performance cars typically arriving from the showroom with 300 to 400 horsepower. And even family cars are now pushing the 200 horsepower barrier quite easily. So power output has certainly increased over the years. Some of that may be down to the need to maintain the performance because of all the extra impact protection and cars being somewhat heavier than they were. Although manufacturing standards and materials used have also kept those weight additions down substantially. Another thing that you'll notice is the older cars had lots of space around the engine. You effectively just had your engine, your alternator, and your battery in there. And there was loads of room. You could have a party. If you were a group of cats, you could throw a party quite happily in that massive engine bay. But you compare that to a, a modern engine. This two liter TDI engine is just absolutely filling the engine bay. So you would struggle to even swing a mouse around in that engine bay. There is so little spare room and that can make removing parts very difficult. You often have to take the front of the car or drop the engine in order to work on it in these modern cars just because space is at a premium in that engine bay because of the added complexity, the additional pipe work, the additional electronics that have been fitted to the engine in order to keep everything running smoothly. So as each manufacturer have evolved their product lineup you really need a whole different skill set working on different brands of cars. They've all done slightly different things. They've got slightly different equipment or slightly different standards or tolerances. So it really pays if you're not working on the car yourself to go to a mechanic who understands your car brand. The mechanic on the street corner that is familiar with all different makes and models will often make mistakes just through a lack of knowledge or a lack of appreciation. It's often silly things like using the wrong grade of engine oil or the wrong coolant. I've done videos on both of those on how important the correct choice of these fluids is. So things have moved on. As we've said earlier, cars are more reliable. They're putting out more power. The service intervals are somewhat longer. Don't get me started on the 24,000 mile oil change intervals that manufacturers are often recommending now. You know my thoughts on that already, but please let me know in the comments what you think of the manufacturer's longer service schedules and service life. But basically, if you have a modern car and you look after it, you service it regularly, you change the oil regularly, that's probably one of the biggest critical things. And you drive it sympathetically, you don't abuse it when the engine's cold. See the video that I did on cold start because that's proved to be quite popular and generated quite a lot of debate. A lot of people are completely oblivious to the damage they're doing to their car just by driving it too hard in that cold state. Invest in quality tools as well. Make sure you have the correct set of tools for your car, for the job that you're trying to do. How many times I've gone out to work on my car and I've not had the right tool to do a job and I've had to put things back together, drive, pick up the new tool or get a friend to bring the tool down in order to use it and just wasted a lot of time. So sit down, think carefully about the job that you're trying to do and just make sure you've got all of the tools that you need to get the parts apart and get the new or the replacement or the repair actually carried out. So modern cars are definitely more complex. They're definitely harder to fix and repair. But personally, I wouldn't go back. Modern cars have so much more to offer than their crude, basic, dinosaur older counterparts. But let me know what you think about cars. Would you rather have a new car or an old car? Do you do the work on the car yourself or do you get a trusted local mechanic to do it for you? And just stay informed with all aspects of car care and maintenance. And I've lined this video up for you that will help you to do just that. So please subscribe if you haven't done so. Boot the like button because that really does help us to get out there. And I'll see you in that next video. Thanks for watching.